A mastermind targets one of New York's most famous landmarks. It was the greatest hotel robbery of all time. With surgical precision, he and his crew take control of the Pierre Hotel for an entire night. The planning and the execution of this robbery was superb. And steal millions belonging to society's elite. Find out how, next on Masterminds. City. When it comes to New Year's Eve, there's no better place on earth to celebrate. There's lots to do here, and uh, you know, the, uh, the important people uh, like to spend New Year's Eve in New York City. After the celebrations, the rich and famous retire to one of the finest hotels in the world. I think if heaven had a hotel, it would be the Pierre. The Pierre Hotel was perhaps the most elegant hotel in New York and possibly in America. Uh, kings, queens, princes, uh, they all stayed there. And the richest guests feel confident locking their valuables in the Pierre's steel-reinforced safety deposit boxes. The Pierre boasts more security than any hotel in Manhattan. But in the early hours of January the 2nd, 1972, while guests slept peacefully in their beds, a gang of tuxedo-clad criminals took over and ran the Pierre Hotel. The first cops on the crime scene got quite a surprise. They saw the handcuffs on the floor now and, the, uh, and all the people around. And then they saw the, uh, uh, the devastation done to the safe deposit boxes. When the detectives came, there was virtually no clues. Within a two-hour period, they cleaned out 50 boxes. There's no question that the, the planning and the execution of this robbery was superb. They knew what they were doing. These are professional thieves. They don't fly by nights. Estimates have ranged from a low of four to five million to a high of 10. The robbery was a front-page story uh, in all the newspapers, from the New York Times to the New York Post and around the country. It was the greatest uh, hotel robbery of all time. A band of thieves had taken over one of Manhattan's busiest hotels and without firing a shot, made off with millions in cash and jewels. It was the work of master jewel thief, Bobby Comfort. To his neighbors in Rochester, Bobby Comfort is a regular family man. What they don't know is he's really America's most amazing jewel thief. Comfort had been burglarizing homes and department stores from the age of 12. But his career as a thief takes off when he teams up with Sammy Nalo, a small-time hood with a love of gambling. They met in prison, uh, Bobby and, and Sammy. Turns out they were both interested in similar things, robbing people and making a lot of money. And, and Sammy was kind of a, a, a nervous uh, person with uh, sticking to all, you know, all the details. Bobby was a little cooler, a little more relaxed. The impulsive Nalo and the charming Comfort start robbing some of Manhattan's biggest hotels. They went from hotel to hotel, making the, uh, the police commissioner and others in the city crazy because uh, they couldn't stop them and uh, they could not with them. Comfort and Nalo become so brazen that in the fall of 1970, they break into the hotel room of movie star Sophia Loren, robbing her at gunpoint of $700,000 in jewels. Comfort now sets his sights on a bigger prize, the landmark Pierre Hotel. He knows it won't be easy, with over 200 guests, an enormous staff, and more security than any Manhattan hotel. He'll have to do his homework. He went to the library, reading up on the history of the Pierre and also the various elements that went into the building of the Pierre. Comfort commits the location of all entrances, exits, and stairwells to memory. He then checks in as a guest in order to scope out the actual location. And he went on the guise of Dr. Wilson 
and he used credit cards of Dr. Wilson because it came into Bobby's possession by some robbery of his. And it says something also about uh, the how deft Comfort was because he was passing himself off as a doctor. Every night he had a, a strange habit of taking a walk at about 4 o'clock in the morning. So he just walked around and was friendly and saw how all the other people acted, and he didn't seem suspicious at all. From his seat in the lobby, Comfort studies the coming and going of hotel staff, determining who's on duty and at what time. He also learns the Pierre locks its doors every night at 1 a.m., admitting only registered guests. Most importantly, he discovers that around 4 a.m., the night clerk unlocks the vault containing the safety deposit boxes to perform his nightly audit. Now Comfort sends Sammy Nalo into New York's seedy underworld to recruit the experienced thieves they'll need. They then secure a hideout close to the hotel. Sammy Nalo had uh, rented an apartment, uh, what they call a railroad flat, on the far west side of uh, Midtown. And uh, it was a shabby place, but this is the place that they were going to go to right after the robbery. Comfort purchases two cars, a sedan and a stretch limousine, which he stores in a downtown parking lot. Knowing the importance of a clean getaway, Comfort clocks the escape route between the Pierre and the hideout at exactly seven minutes. The only thing left to do now is set the date. Because the rich show off their jewelry on New Year's Eve, he schedules the robbery for the night after, when the banks will be closed, forcing the rich to put their gems in the Pierre's safety deposit boxes. The night before the robbery, Comfort makes a reservation and tells the clerk he'll be checking in late. He instructs his team to meet at the hideout at 2.30 a.m. To make sure they won't look out of place, he insists they wear tuxedos, and the driver dress as a chauffeur. He also has the men wear false beards and hair pieces to draw attention away from their faces. Before leaving, he hands each of the men a gun. There's never an indication, Bobby uh, particularly, that he ever injured anybody. On the other hand, he always had a gun with him. And so um, if there was going to be a problem with the authorities particularly, I think he was prepared uh, to show them the gun at least. Disguised as Dr. Wilson, Comfort and the chauffeur get into the limousine and head for the Pierre. Nalo and the other thieves follow closely in the second car. At precisely 3.45 a.m., the limo pulls up to a little-used side entrance. Nalo and the others park on the street, approaching the doorway on foot and concealing themselves in the shadows. There was a guard, a security guard, at the door. This is 4 o'clock in the morning. Bobby said, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Wilson. I'm staying here. And so the security guard opened the door. As soon as they're through the door, the team splits up. They must act quickly to lock down the hotel and take over all operations before the guests become suspicious. Bobby immediately heads upstairs to secure the front desk. Bobby Comfort, of course, uh, knew where the buttons were for the security, for the alarms. He immediately leaped over the desk and grabbed one of the clerks before he could hit the alarm button. Behind the scenes, Nalo tracks down the rest of the staff. And as they're going down, they're slowly picking up employees. You got to have a little elevator operator there, you got cleaning people who are working there, and they're rounding them up, they're going towards the desk. Lo and behold, there's a security guard coming down some stairs, and he's wondering, what, who are these people? And then, so they just came up and put the gun to him and don't move, come with us. He had a gun and said, this is a robbery, and uh, we want to take you over here. You're not going to be hurt. But they all they put in this big room near the clerk's office, which held a lot of people. And they started to handcuff the people, and 
and gag them? Within 10 minutes, Comfort and Nalo have taken all 19 employees hostage. Now they face their greatest challenge, take over hotel operations and keep everything running smoothly. Now they all station and take their position in the hotel. Bobby instructs his men to dress as hotel staff and round up any unwanted guests. He puts on the night clerk's uniform and takes charge of the front desk. All calls will now have to go through Bobby Comfort. Meanwhile, Nalo gets to work on the safety deposit boxes. Two of them are on the safes. They're banging away with the, with the hammers and the chisels. Those were no safes with the hinges were on the outside. And all you, you need a two pound sledge chisel, whack, knocked off the hinges. And you could, with a crowbar, you could open a box on the back of it. After opening 25 boxes, Nalo realizes they've got trouble. He's finding very little of value, and time is running out. They're not hitting the good boxes, so they So they go back to the clerk and they say, listen, we don't want to hurt you. Bobby says, you have to have a list. Nalo says, you know you better have a list. We don't want you to get hurt. We're not, we're not here to hurt you. Just give up the list. The guy's, he's scared. He nervously puts his hand in his pocket, takes out the keys, and he, says, he opens a drawer, and he gives them the list. Once they have the list, they got it all. Recognizing the names of the richest and most famous guests, they now target specific boxes. Out front, Comfort runs into more trouble. One of the guests, an old man, comes in something like around 5, 5.30, right in the, in, the, in the middle of the robbery. Bobby intercepts him, and now the guy sees the gun, and the guy said, oh my god, he's like, I have a weak heart, I'm not going to be able to take this. And then Bobby puts the gun away and says, look, it's OK. No one's going to be hurt. Would you want a glass of water? Uh, he gets him a glass of water. He said, everything is going to be OK. We're going to have to handcuff you. In fact, that's when uh, Nalo did a little thievery for himself. With his partner's back turned, Nalo pockets almost $2 million in jewels. As they say, you know, you know, life doesn't run smoothly. Robberies don't run smoothly either. The incessant ringing of the phone demands Bobby's attention. A newlywed couple wants champagne sent to their room. Bobby has no choice but to dispatch one of his men and take them hostage. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside the vault, Nalo hits the jackpot. In a single box, he finds $800,000 in cash. With the arrival of the morning deliveries and more hotel staff on the way, Comfort knows his time is up. Bobby said, Sammy, we got to get out of here because it's getting close to 7 o'clock. And Sammy said, no, I got one more, I got one more, we have to do one more. But Bobby finally, virtually, had to drag Sammy out of there because Sammy would have been there until 10 o'clock uh, in the morning. At the end of the robbery, just before they were going to leave, Comfort said to the bellhops, the guests who had been rounded up, and also there were the security guards. And he said, I appreciate the cooperation of all of you people. And for your efforts, I'd like to do something for you. He said, I want to give all of you $20. And he put $20 in all of their pockets, all but the security guards. Bobby never liked cops. After controlling the hotel for four hours and cramming their suitcases with $10 million in cash and jewels, the thieves check out of the Pierre. Back at their hideout, Bobby divides up the cash and keeps the gems to be fenced. He's pulled off his greatest heist, over $10 million in cash and jewels. His only problem will be his right-hand man. Bobby Comfort has pulled off the hotel heist of the century. Within one hour of the robbery, the Pierre Hotel is swarming with detectives, newspaper, and television crews. 
The robbery was a front page story uh, in all the newspapers, from the New York Times to the New York Post, and around the country. The cops are under enormous pressure to make an arrest. It couldn't be handled by just one team that of men, as other cases would be handled. It had to be handled by, by everybody in the squads. A thorough investigation of the crime scene turns up no evidence. The only fingerprint found on the desk belongs to the police. And because of the robber's disguises, not one of the hostages is able to give a clear description. The crew plans to lay low. Back home in Rochester, Bobby receives a call. He learns Nalo has gambling debts with the mob, and if he doesn't pay up, he's a dead man. Comfort agrees to help Nalo find a buyer for some of the stolen jewels. In the off chance he's pulled in for questioning, Bobby asks an associate to come with him and carry the jewels. They check into a Manhattan hotel. Well, they put the word out that they had, uh, they were looking for fences people that would buy stolen property. In no time, Bobby and Sammy are contacted by someone interested in buying the jewels. Comfort sends his associate to complete the transaction. But what Comfort and Nalo don't know is that the would-be buyer is really an FBI agent. The associate is caught red-handed when the FBI come crashing in. A hotel receipt found in his pocket leads the police straight to Bobby Comfort. We went to hit a specific room down there, the Royal Manhattan Hotel, and possibly one of the members of the stick-up crew that had stuck up the Pierre Hotel would be in that room. When the door opened, there were three guns pointing at Bobby Comfort. We entered the room. We placed him under arrest, put handcuffs on him, searched him, at which point I found some diamonds in his pocket. Now they had comfort, but they still needed Nalo. The name of uh, Sammy came up. At that time, they called Sammy the Arab. He had a, a lot of aliases. Having previously tailed Sammy on the Sophia Loren case, investigators visit an apartment where they believe Sammy may be staying. They're greeted at the door by a woman. We go up to 4A, but now there a woman opened the door, and uh, she tells us uh, that uh, the gentleman wasn't home. She said to us, well, he's a, he's a very nice man. Sammy is wonderful. This is the first time that we hear the name Sammy. Ooh, so we were hot. Police quickly determine the girlfriend is an illegal immigrant from Colombia. Terrified of being deported, she offers to take the police to the Bronx to find another of Sammy's apartments. So we went up there. And we went up the hill and down the hill, and she sees it. And all of a sudden, she says, there it is. And she points at the house. As they pull up to the curb, who should exit the building but Sammy Nalo himself? Jumping out of their car, the cops close in on him. I see him throw a bag underneath a truck. Hearing a noise from behind, Sammy turns I stop him. He says, Tomato, you know who we are. And I frisk him down, and I find in his pocket, I find three rings without the stones. Inside the apartment is where we find the papers. So then we saw his passport. His bags are packed on it. He was ready to go. Another 10 minutes, he would have been gone. Four days after the heist, Police have Comfort and Nalo in custody. Convicting them, however, will prove a lot harder. Many of the wealthy guests whose possessions were stolen want nothing to do with the investigation. Nobody wanted to get involved. Nobody wanted to testify. Nobody wanted to come to ID. Those who do testify have trouble identifying the robbers. I remember the six people being interviewed who had Sammy Nalo as six foot four when he was really five foot four, uh, very fat when he was slim, uh, had a, a, a bushel head of hair when he didn't. To make matters worse, the FBI also refuses to participate. Their position is we can't expose our, um, our informants and we can't expose our undercover agents. 
In the end, the only evidence tying Comfort and Nalo to the Pierre robbery is a few gemstones. And based on that, a plea was taken of possession of stolen goods, having nothing to do with the robbery. Jewel thief Bobby Comfort and accomplice Nalo plead guilty to possession of stolen goods in exchange for a maximum four-year sentence. After his release from prison, Bobby Comfort returns home to his wife and children. On June 6, 1986, surrounded by his family, Robert Anthony Comfort dies of a heart attack. His pal Sammy Nalo was gunned down outside his own travel agency in October 1988. Rumor had it, due to unpaid gambling debts. With the exception of jewels seized in the sting operation, police never did find the rest of the Pierre loot. I love the fact that they wore a black tie. I love the fact that they pulled up in a limousine. I don't want to sound like I admire crime that much, but by the same token, I, uh, I walked away with some admiration for them. Done it meets How Done It Again. Tomorrow, join us for another all new Mastermind Double from Three. Meanwhile, a man fakes his own death by murdering an old friend. That's in Crime Stories. Next.